Hi, I'm Dr. Patrick Jones from the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about inflammation today. And inflammation is really a pain, right? I mean, uh, especially as we start advancing in years and, and leave our 30s, <laughs> horror of horrors, uh, <laughs> we start noticing things, you know? Uh, <laughs> and uh, inflammation uh, can come from injuries, but it can just come from having a good time too, you know? Um, but there's, so what do you do about it? Well, I mean, you can take pills, right? I mean, there's aspirin and there's ibuprofen and there's acetaminophen and there's all kinds of things. Um, and if that's not enough, you can get prescription pain medications uh, and they work, all those things work. And if that's all that works, you know, then that's what you do. But uh, there are some significant side effects and man, if you ever want a really scary experience, you know, turn out all the lights in your house and get a flashlight on some dark stormy night and read the warnings on some of those medications. So they, they have some pretty significant uh, problems for some people. So what if I told you that there were some simple, natural, inexpensive, easy ways to go from this to this, right? That's better. And there really are some things we can do. First thing we can do is we can eat better. Now, you probably heard the, the saying, you are what you eat, right? Yikes, right? <laughs> I mean, these days, that's a pretty alarming idea. Uh, I mean, you don't really want to be this guy, right? Um, and so, basically, one of the first things we can do to get, decrease inflammation is quit eating garbage. You know, quit eating food that's not food. Um, the modern diet is chock full of stuff that we just were not designed to eat. And, uh, you know, specifically, let's, let's look at some of them. I mean, whoops. Refined carbohydrates are, are a big culprit in inflammation. Um, and by refined carbohydrates, what am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about sugar, obviously, that's bad. But I'm also talking about white flour, bread, uh, potatoes, pasta, pizza dough, you know, breakfast cereals, all of those things are really high in refined carbohydrates. And what does that mean? Well, that means they're made out of sugar. Because honestly, your body can't tell the difference between a baked potato and cotton candy. All right, they all get broken down into the same simple sugars. And well, what's the problem with that? Don't cells run on sugars? Well, yeah, they do. But when we have them at such high levels, some such unnaturally high levels, um, we shift the dynamic of our of our bodies and what happens is that insulin levels raise dramatically to get rid of all that sugar because insulin is the hormone that unlocks the cell membranes basically to poke the sugar into the cells okay that's his job and so if you eat a lot of simple sugars and that can be a baked potato you know a, a white bread pizza dough breakfast cereal when we eat a lot of simple sugars the insulin goes up and the bad news is that insulin is really, really inflammatory, okay? And so, you know, you'll notice during the holidays that we went through here not too many months ago, you know, if you eat a lot of sweets and a lot of sugars, you know, you can hardly get out of bed the next morning if you're over 40, you know, because, because of the inflammation. At least that's how I am. Uh, if I eat a lot of sugars, my inflammation levels go way up. The other thing is soda pop, and that's, you know, this is also simple sugars, but I gave it its own spot on the list because it's a liquid, right? <laughs> and it's really, really a very common source of high levels of simple sugars. Um, and not just soda pop. I mean, a lot of the fruit juices, you know, if it's straight fruit juice, then it might be okay. Uh, and it might be better depending on which berry and which juice it is. It might be not too bad, uh, especially if it's a berry. Berries have a lower hypo, have a lower glycemic index than apples or things like that, uh, that you make juice out of. But if you're ever looking at juice, you know, if you ever picked up a bottle of like, say cranberry juice, and it says on there, cranberry juice cocktail, well, <laughs> if it just says cranberry juice, you're okay, that's not terrible. But if it says cranberry juice cocktail, what it ought to say is sugar water mixed with red food coloring and the slightest hint of delicious cranberries. <laughs> you know, it's mostly sugar. So, you know, that's another source of high sugars, 
meaning high insulin, meaning high inflammation. Red meat, yeah, red meat can cause inflammation too, uh, especially if you cook it at high temperatures. Um, if you cook it at high temperatures, it can create what are called advanced glyca glycation uh, end products. And boy, I hate it when that happens, right? But <laughs> advanced glycation end products are can be really uh, precursors and exacerbators of inflammation. Okay, they can make it a lot worse. Um, it also contains a lot of arachidonic acid, which can also uh, increase inflammation. It's got other omega-6 fatty acids that are also precursor to inflammation. And so, you know, red meat itself can be, if you eat too much of it, can cause more inflammation and make the inflammation you have worse. Now, if you want to really have trouble, eat processed red meats, okay? So not all meats are created equal, and processed red meats, stuff that's cured or, you know, corned or smoked or dried or canned, those kinds of red meats um, are vastly more likely to cause increased inflammation than regular red meat. So if you're going to eat red meat, you know, eat it medium rare, cook it on a lower heat, and don't, you know, smoke it or can it or, I mean, if you smoke it yourself, it's probably all right. Um, but, you know, buying chemically created and processed red meats can be a very significant uh, contributor to inflammation. Trans fats are a big deal too. And a, a trans fat is a liquid fat that they've uh, glued the hydrogen molecules to, so they've hydrogenated it, right? They've hydrogenated it, and that creates from the liquid a solid fat that they can use uh, for cooking and frying stuff. They use it a lot these these trans fats, they use them a lot in fried foods, you know, so you go to the fast food joint and you get onion rings or fish or, you know, french fries or things like that that are fried, deep fried, they're going to have a lot of hydrogenated trans fats in them. And they just increase inflammation too. They put it in margarine a lot, okay? If you're going to eat fats in your diet, so my rule of thumb for fats and oils is don't eat oils from things that you can't squeeze and get oil out of them, right? I mean, you can squeeze an olive and get oil. You can squeeze an avocado and get oil. You can squeeze a fish and get oil. You can't squeeze corn and get oil, right? You can't squeeze canola and get oil. Um, and so a lot of the oils um, that are being used a lot in, in the modern food industry uh, aren't, you know, aren't naturally occurring oils, and, and they've got all kinds of, uh, chemical processes in them that make them much less safe and much less healthy and much less good for us. Okay, so stick with the stick with the real oils uh, from uncomplicated <laughs> sources that don't require any chemical intervention or engineers to make them. So what should you eat? Well, there's a lot of good things we can eat, right? We can eat vegetables <laughs> and fruits. You know, dark leafy greens especially are great. Nuts. Uh, the good oils, like I mentioned, the olive oil, avocado oil, stuff like that. Fruit's good, especially berries. Berries tend to have much lower glycemic indices than other fruits. And what do I mean by that? Well, the glycemic index is how much sugar is in it and what kind of sugar. All right. And so things with really high glycemic index, like a white potato, you know, it might as well be sugar, right? Might as well be table sugar. Um, but berries, you know, like blueberries and blackberries and guys like that, they have sugars in them, but they're different kinds of sugars. There's more fructose, and, and the body breaks them into things that are less uh, contributory to insulin release and, and high sugar contact and all the inflammatory things that go with it. Okay. Uh, fermented foods are great, and we'll talk about that some more in a minute. Legumes are great, and fish, especially fatty fish are really good. Uh, and so, okay, what if you don't like fish? Well, if you don't like fish, take fish oil. And what if you don't like fish oil? You know, I can tell people that don't like fish oil, usually it's people that have tasted it, right? <laughs> Not great, but good news, <laughs> you can buy fish oil that tastes good, right? This is the Barleen's and they make some omega-3, some of them are vegan, some of them have fish oil, but they have oils in them uh, that have omega-3 fatty acids and other omega acids that are in their proper balance and really great for you. And they taste fantastic. 
And I don't get anything from these guys for telling you this. Uh, I think you should all write them a letter and say, Mr. Marlene, give Doc Jones a nickel every time someone buys a jug of your stuff because he said so. And I wouldn't have to work anymore because I tell everybody to take this. Um, tastes really good. And it's a really great source of omega-3 acids and other fatty acids in the right balance. And that's really important. Um, and that in and of itself decreases inflammation. Okay. It's also, you know, as an herbalist, I'll tell you another secret. These Barleen uh, Omega products are a great way to get tinctures into people. You know, if you got a little kid and you need to give them a tincture, you know, you can put it in a little juice and that usually works. But some of them really taste bad. And if you put it in this Omega-3 stuff, this Barleen's fruity Omega stuff, you can get about any tincture into a little kid. So just a, a tip from an herbalist. <laughs> um, you can also take probiotics and prebiotics. All right. So what does that even mean? So probiotics are bugs, right? Bacteria. Our, our gut contains millions and millions of beneficial microorganisms, most of which are bacteria. And there's a lot of them. I mean, they outnumber our cells. You know, estimates are about 10 to 1. So for every one of our body cells, there's 10 of those little guys helping us out. All right. And they do all kinds of things. They you know, help with digestion. Um, they produce hormones and neurotransmitters and, you know, things like serotonin, which is the chemical that makes your brain think everything's going to be okay today um, and, is, and is a part of all kinds of neurotransmitter and muscle and nerve interactions. And we could get into that for two hours, but we're not going to. Um, you know, they make, uh, they have an impact on immunity, significant impact on immunity, and they have a significant impact on inflammation, on decreasing it and modulating it and managing it, okay? Um, so that's great to have all those little bugs in there. But sometimes bad things happen to them, right? Sometimes pharmaceuticals, especially antibiotics, can beat the heck out of them. And all of a sudden you have imbalances and disproportionate numbers of the wrong guys. And it's a real disaster because our bodies were created and designed to operate in a, in a synergistic way with these microorganisms. And if you got the wrong bugs in there or you don't have any bugs in there or not enough bugs of the right bugs, well, now everything's out of balance and you got trouble, okay? And so you can take probiotics. And a probiotic is a capsule full of, you know, lyophilized, dried little bacteria that are still alive. And, uh, you, you know, those are great. You can also take... Uh, Fermented foods, you know, sauerkraut and kimchi and kombucha and all those guys that are, you know, fermented live uh, foods and beverages. There's yogurts like that. There's uh, kimchi and there's, you know, apple cider vinegar that still has the mother, you know, that's still a living thing. Um, and, and those contain gut bugs that are good for you too, okay? I mean, heck, if you pull a carrot out of the dirt and don't scrub it too bad and just wipe the dirt off and eat it, that's a great source of a lot of those bacteria that are good for you, okay? And so um, there's ways to get them into our bodies. So that's great. So probiotics are great. But what's a prebiotic? So a prebiotic is food for the probiotics, okay? Well, it's food for the bacteria, for those microflora. Um, and there are lots of herbs that are great prebiotics. All right, so what do they want? Well, there's all kinds of nutrients and vitamins and things that they need like we need. But they also, what they really love is long, insoluble fibers. You know, we can't even digest them. Mammals have no enzymes at all to digest insoluble fibers, and plants are full of them. You know, if you look at a cow, a cow has no enzymes whatsoever to digest the stuff that grass is made out of, cellulose. So how do cows make a living eating grass? Well, it's because they have a 30-gallon vat called the rumen, one of their four stomachs, that's just a big fermentation vat full of billions of bacteria that love to eat grass, right? And they've got the enzymes to break up that cellulose, and they break it up into little, uh, you know, molecules that mammals can break down and digest and use, okay? And so... Um, we're not, uh, you know, humans aren't using them for that very much for 
pre-digesting cellulose nearly as much as some of the herbivores are, but we are a little bit. Um, but they're also doing all those other things for us. They're making hormones. They're making. Uh, they're helping with digestion of other things. Uh, they're helping with immunity. They're helping with all kinds of great stuff. And so we take probiotics and we take fermented foods and we add, you know, billions and billions of these little guys to our gut. And maybe we should buy them some lunch, right? I mean, if we're going to invite them to the party, <laughs> maybe we better have some food there for them. And so if you're going to take probiotics and you're going to take fermented foods and feel really great about doing it, then you ought to take some prebiotics with it, okay? And so herbs like uh, burdock root, uh, elecampane root, garlic, flaxseed, dandelion root, you know, they all have a lot of nutrients, especially uh, that insoluble fiber. There's one called inulin uh, that is just the favorite food of those gut bacteria that all these plants have a lot of in in their roots and in their structures. Uh, in fact, elecampane, the genus for elecampane is inula. That's where the word inulin came from. You know, that's where they discovered it and described it, it was this, this great fiber that's in this root, this tough root. <laughs> so prebiotics are really great too. So if you have good gut flora and you take care of your good gut flora, those little guys also will have a market effect on helping to decrease inflammation. So, and if you don't want to grow your own or yank your own out, I know where you can get some. This is a prebiotic formula that, that we have over at homegrownerbalist.net. It's got all those kinds of herbs in it. Okay, you can go to that and have a look. There's also some herbs that can decrease inflammation. Okay, and uh, this is just a collection of herbs that I use for inflammation cases. Um, and it works very, very well. And let's go through some of these guys, all right? Let's go through and talk about each one. Um, so Boswellia is the uh, herbalist name for frankincense. Essential oil guys call it frankincense. We call it uh, Boswellia, mostly. Um, and I'm talking about the herb, the, you know, the, the actual tree sap, uh, which is what it is. It's a tree sap from the Middle East. Uh, grows on the Arabian Peninsula in Northern Africa. Um, and it has really tremendous anti-inflammatory properties. Um, and especially if you combine it with turmeric, those two together um, have a very synergistic one plus one equals three kind of anti-inflammatory effect, all right? And so um, Boswellia and turmeric root are great sources. Black cohosh has some anti-inflammatory properties as well. Um, but black cohosh is also a muscle relaxant. So if you're having, like if you're having inflammation in your back or in, in your muscles, black cohosh, in addition to helping with the inflammation, it relaxes those muscles, right? Sometimes you tweak your back and you get this horrible spasm and the spasm is worse than, than the tweak. And why does your body do that? Well, it's, it's trying to protect you, right? It's saying, oh, he tweaked his back. Don't ever let him move again, right? <laughs> Because it really hurt last time, right? And so it makes a split. And everybody says, er, don't move. It hurts, right? And so sometimes that cramping and that muscle spasming is worse than the, than the original insult. And black cohosh, in addition to helping with the original insult, which might have been an inflammatory thing, um, also helps with the muscle relaxation. Well, but burdock. Burdock is another one. This is burrs. It's like the burr under your saddle burr, okay? It's the root that's the medicine. Uh, and you want to collect that root, it's a biennial plant. So it has a two-year life cycle. So you want to collect it either in the fall of the first year or spring of the second year. You want to collect it before it shoots up to a flower seed and die the second year. So spring of the second year is great. That's when they're biggest. That's when I harvest them. Um, burdock also has some anti-inflammatory properties. Um, and we can get into all the phytochemistry. And, you know, if you want to do that, join the Homegrown Herbalist School and we'll get really deep into some of this stuff. I have a, a lecture on burdock. In fact, it's on YouTube somewhere. Go to my channel. Go to Homegrown Herbalist and search for burdock. There's like a two-hour video just on burdock. Okay. And that's almost as much as we talk about it in the school. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we can do that with any one of these plants. Uh, but burdock, it has some anti-inflammatory properties, a few. But it's also a, a kidney tonic and a liver tonic. And so in addition to directly decreasing inflammation a little bit. It's also 
you know, helping the kidneys get toxins and junk out of the blood, helping the liver to get toxins and junk out of the blood. And, you know, if those toxins are going out in the urine or going out in the bile into the gut to be excreted, then they're not precipitating into your joints and causing inflammation, right? Devil's claw, this is actually an African plant, but it works so well. I, I you know, a lot of these anti-inflammatory plants are from fun, exotic places. You know, Boswellia is from the Middle East and turmeric from India. Devil's claw is from Africa. Um, but, uh, and there's plants on every continent that can do all these things. These are just some really great ones I like. Devil's Claw is another great anti-inflammatory. Um, ginger is a good anti-inflammatory. And it also, ginger um, also is warming. You know, it improves circulation. It's, it's what they call a rubefacient. You know, so it, in addition to directly doing a few things with interfering with cytokines and, and other inflammatory mediators, it also improves circulation. It just gets your blood flowing. Well, what does that do? Well, as your blood's flowing better, right? And burdock, this is part of burdock's action too, cleaning things up, getting things moving better. As blood is moving better, you're going to have more oxygen and you're going to have more flushing away of prostaglandins and cytokines and all kinds of other guys that are causing inflammation, right? They're not going to be hanging around making that tissue angrier and angrier. They're going to get flushed away by better blood flow, okay? And so that's... Uh, one of, you know, ginger does it in a couple of ways. Yucca, also great. Yucca is uh, um, a plant that's found in the desert southwest of the United States. Um, really a pokey rascal, the root's the medicine on that one. And it has some chemicals in it that address inflammation in different ways than these other guys. Um, it's, it's much more similar to a, a corticosteroid like prednisone or dexamethasone. It's not either of those things, okay? But its effect is similar. Um, without the side effects, incidentally, which is nice. Um, and so it also is anti-inflammatory. Now, if you want to make all of these guys work better, especially the turmeric, which adores black pepper, add some black pepper. Uh, so when you're taking these herbs, if you take some fresh ground black pepper, and it's got to be fresh ground or tinctured, but if it's black pepper from your pepper shaker that was ground up six months ago, you know, it's probably not very good, not very strong. Fresh ground is way better. Uh, the shelf life of fresh ground black pepper isn't very good, unless you're tincturing it, that's okay. Um, I just did a, I don't know if that's up yet. There's a black pepper video either on YouTube or coming soon, okay? <laughs> I did it the other day, but I don't know if it's uploaded. Anyway, uh, that's a whole other topic too. But uh, black pepper also has some anti-inflammatory properties of its own, has some capsation in it and some other things that can help with inflammation. But it also improves absorption and bioavailability and utility of these other herbs. So it just makes them work better, all right? Um, so, and again, uh, all those herbs happen to be in this formula if you want to grab it. If you want the easy button, just do that. Um, but anyway, there are some great things you can do, and we could get into this much, much deeper, um, you know, and we do that. In the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine, we talk a lot about everything, you know. Um, there's, I'm trying to remember, just on pain, I think there's four lessons, three or four lessons that are probably a couple hours each, just on pain, okay. So if you want to understand things on a very deep level, um, if you want to know what's been working for me as a veterinarian practicing for 30 years and as a traditional naturopath practicing on people, with people, uh, have a look at the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. If you liked the video, uh, give us a click on that little like button and the subscribe button and there's share buttons. There's a lot of buttons. Click buttons. That's fun. I'm Dr. Patrick Jones from the Homegrown Herbalist School of Botanical Medicine. Thanks for listening and have a great day. Mm -hmm.